morning, everyone. Uh, this is Professor Cicerelli. So this morning, we are going to be looking at logic and reason and how we use logic and reason to persuade in our writing. So we'd spoken previously about three different ways that we can persuade in our writing. We said that applying emotion, using and playing on the reader or the audience's emotion is an effective way to persuade. We called this pathos. When I rely on emotions, I can get people in a short, in a really short period of time, um, change their beliefs to, to act a certain way. Um, and the same thing with ethos. Ethos was the other term we used um, for a different kind of persuasion, which was using authority perception, the per perception of the, um, the author or the speaker uh, in order to persuade. So if I see somebody, if I see a doctor in a white lab coat, um, I automatically give more authority to what they're saying. So using, using um, the white lab coat, using a, speaking in a certain way is a way to convey authority and we would call this ethos. So pathos, the emotional, and then ethos, the um, using, using image and authority. The downside of both pathos and ethos is that they don't convince in the long term. Short term, they might be effective, and really effective. You'll, you often see pathos and ethos used in commercials. Uh, what really convinces in the long term, though, is logic. Logic and reasoning. We call that third kind of uh, persuasion logos. Okay, um, And so... That's the way we're really going to convince in the long term. And reason and, and so logos in, includes reasoning, which we're going to break down further today with, into deductive and inductive. But it includes reasoning, includes, includes using facts and statistics, um, expert testimony, all of these things. Okay? This, this is logos. And so we want to be able to, in our writing, use good, strong reasoning because... As a part of Logos, that's what's going to convince our reader in the long term. And so we can take reasoning and we can break it down into two kinds. Um, one type is called deductive reasoning and the other kind is called inductive reasoning. They're both different and in a way they are sort of the reverse of each other. So and we're going to talk about both today. We're going to spend a little more time talking about deductive reasoning, but both are really important. Um, especially when it comes to talking about logical fallacies, which we'll talk about at the very end today. Um, so with deductive reasoning, what we're doing when we, when we are reasoning something deductively is we're starting with a general idea, observation, principle, okay? And then from that general idea, principle, we are deriving something specific. Specific idea, specific principle, etc. Okay, but one of the one of the um, one of the textbook examples of a of a deductive argument, a good deductive argument, is starts starts with the general premise or principle that all humans are mortal. I mean, all humans will die eventually. Person X. Is a human being, right? Therefore, con specific conclusion: person X will die. Okay, so you'll see how in a deductive argument we start with that general idea: all humans are mortal, and then from that general idea we arrive at and deduce something specific. Okay, and we'll get, and we're going to get into a lot more um, ways of looking at deductive arguments and, and breaking them down and, and, and analyzing in a second. So the what's what's great about deductive arguments is if we set them up the right way, we can, and we'll talk about setting them up too, um, if we set up a deductive argument in the right way, we can guarantee we can guarantee a conclusion. Okay? That's a pretty that's pretty strong. If we're talking about wanting to be persuasive in our in our arguments and in our reasoning, a guarantee can't get, can't get better than a guarantee, okay? So that's provided, though, that we set up our, our general statements and principles 
in the right way in order to arrive at our specific conclusion. But a guarantee is great. Okay. Inductive arguments, like I said, are kind of the reverse of deductive arguments. Inductive arguments start with something specific, or start with many specific instances, cases, and then from those specific cases, hope to arrive at something general. Okay, so we start with the specific, we arrive at the general. Okay. Great example, how doctors look at patients. Okay, let's say, let's imagine that I'm a doctor and I have 10 patients who come into me, come in to see me, and they all have lung issues, difficulty breathing, some of them might even have lung cancer. And I notice that all of them have been longtime smokers, let's say, smoking for more than 10 years, smoking cigarettes. Okay. So from those 10 specific instances, I try I you know, examining them, making sure they're, they have similar backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I try to arrive at the general statement or the general conclusion that smoking causes lung cancer in people. Okay? So I start with those specific examples and I hope to arrive at a general conclusion. Now, unlike the deductive argument, inductive arguments, there's no guarantee. So no guarantees, okay? The best we can do with inductive arguments are that they're really, really, they're really solid. Um, lots, of, lots of specific cases, um, et cetera, but we can't ever guarantee a conclusion with inductive arguments. Best we can do is to be really, really sure of something. Okay, uh, so that's one of the, I guess you could say one of the downsides of the inductive argument is that we're never going to have a solid, um, solid conclusion. There's always going to be a way to pick apart an inductive argument. Now, part of that means that when we read other people who are making arguments, if we see that they're making an inductive argument, as many authors will, uh, we're going to be looking for ways to, if we're reading, if we're reading critically, we're going to be looking for ways to uh, poke holes in their in their inductive argument. And so we'll talk at the end about logical fallacies. So problems with both deductive arguments, how do, you know when when deductive arguments go wrong, and when inductive arguments go wrong. So that we know how we know how. A good deductive argument works, how a good inductive argument works, but also how bad ones work too. And so that as we're reading, uh, as we're reading arguments, we can be we can be critical of them. We can we can make judgments about them, um, seeing how they are set up. Okay. So I want to start off talking about deductive arguments, if we can. So with deductive arguments, we said that we start with general ideas and we hope to arrive at something specific. So what I'd like us to do is to look at to look at some examples of deductive arguments. To look at them and then ask ourselves, do these deductive arguments are they good? And so when it when it comes to deciding whether a deductive argument is good or not, um we have two two points we're going to be looking at. We want to look for two things. One is what's called, is the argument valid? Okay, so valid means are all of the statements that make up the argument, are all the ideas that make up the argument organized and arranged in the right way? Okay, in the right way, I'm going to break that down and explain what that means in a second when we actually look at some real world examples of them. Okay, so checking to make sure that the arguments, uh, that the statements that make up the argument are arranged properly. The second point we're going to be looking for is, are 
are those statements true? So are the statements arranged in the right way? That would be, are they valid or not? Okay. And then ask ourselves, are they actually true? Are the statements themselves true? Okay. And if both of these things are true, if both one and two are true, then we would say that a deductive argument is sound. It's sound. It's got true statements, and it's the statements are organized in the right way. Okay. All right, so I want to look at some actual examples here. And I want to show you, when we look at them, we'll jump back a little bit. We'll start with this one. So what I want us to do when looking at this first deductive argument is to notice, first of all, that it is deductive. Okay, that first statement, all humans are selfish is a general statement about all humans, right? And then from that, we're going to try to learn something about me, okay? Um, but we're starting with the general and then hoping to arrive at and conclude with the specific, okay? So what I, what I want us to do as we go through is to ask ourselves, are the statements arranged in the right way? Are they arranged properly? Are they valid, okay? And then is each of the statements true, or at least the first two statements true? And if they are, then we would say this argument is sound. Okay. If they're not, then the argument's unsound. Right. So, first thing, so first things first, are these statements organized in the right way? Now, what does that mean? Okay. What that means is, if I, if I were to take these statements, okay, if I were to take them and if I were to draw them out, if I were to draw them out um, graphically, um, I'm a visual learner. I th I think seeing things visually helps. Okay, so, and this will help you also see what I mean by are the statements organized in the right way? Okay, so let's imagine that we were to draw these statements out as circles. And I'll give you, give you an example. Okay, so that first statement, all humans are selfish. Let's imagine a circle. Forgive my circle, I'm drawing on my tablet. Um, imagine a circle that represents all selfish beings, okay? Anything that's in this circle is selfish, okay? It doesn't have to be human, but anything in this, any being that is in this circle is selfish, okay? Now, how would I draw the statement, all humans are selfish? Well, I'd want to have a circle that represents humans, Okay, and I want that human circle to be completely encompassed within the selfish circle because that means all of them. If you are in that human circle, you are also in the selfish circle. Okay, so all humans are selfish. Okay, that's, so that's how that first statement would look if I drew it out visually. Okay, now what would that second statement look like? Professor C is a human. Well, there are many humans. I am not the only. I am not the only one. On Earth, so I would draw a smaller circle within the human circle. I'm taking up a lot of space in that human circle, um, but that's how I would draw Professor C is a human. Okay, so when I ask you the question about the validity of those first two statements, or we'd call them premises, if I ask you about the validity of them, are they organized in the right way? Well, they are. Yeah. Because they're set, one is nested inside the other, which is nested inside the other. So you could see how they, they're they nested inside each other like that. Okay, so so they are valid. They're arranged, they're arranged in the right way um, where one sits inside the other, sits inside the other. Okay, and so my conclusion, Professor C is selfish. So does that, is this conclusion, does this conclusion follow from these two statements. Yes, it, actually it does, yeah. Um, because I can't be in the human circle without being in the selfish circle. So we would say this argument is valid. It's a valid argument. Okay, now, you might be thinking, but that, that can't be right. Something's up there. Okay, well, if you remember back to what I had said earlier, here, when we're looking at arguments, we're asking ourselves two things. 
are they, is the argument valid? And we answered that question. It is, yes. But we're also asking ourselves, is the, are the statements in them true? Are the premises true? So if we go back and look at what we just wrote, um, Professor C is a human. That one we could, we could be pretty certain of. I mean, I, I think I'm a human. Yeah. Uh, so we can be pretty sure of that one. But the first one, all humans are selfish, that one is highly debatable. Highly debatable, right? So we could definitely critique this first statement. Okay, so if we were reading this, if we are reading an argument that was set up in this way, we would we could say, well, premise number two, or the second statement seems to be, tr seems to be true, but that first one, definitely not, or, is or at least is highly debatable, um, highly debatable. And so, while this argument is valid, meaning the statements are organized in such a way where they nest inside each other like this, and so that if this is true and if the second part is true, then the third part has to be has to follow. Um, so it's valid, but it's it's I would not say this is sound. This is definitely not a sound argument because the statements are not both true. Okay, so I want you to see, hopefully from this example, you saw that you can have an argument that's valid where those statements are arranged in the right way, okay, graphically this way, arranged in the right way, but they're not actually true, okay? So what I'd like to do, so we saw that ex as an example, I want to look at a I want to look at one or two more with you. And so hopefully you see the variety in some of these. So, uh, where is the one that I, I want to give you guys another one? Where is it? Oh, did I? Ah, here it is. This one. So have a look at this one. Have a look at this one. So this one is also set up in a. It's also set up deductively, but it is. You're gonna see. You're gonna see how it's um, how it's different than the last argument we just looked at. So also a deductive argument here. Also trying to arrive at, starting with general statement, actually we've got two general statements in this one, and then we're tr from, from those general statements we're trying to arrive at something specific about this particular species here, which happen to be snails. So, how, so if, we look at the, if we look at these statements, how would we draw them out graphically? So let me pause for a second. So if you're watching the video, pause it for a second, and then see how you would draw this out. Pause that for one second. Okay, were you able to do it? Okay, so let's let's look at how we would do this. Okay, first statement, all snakes are cold-blooded. So how would we draw that? Well, we would draw a bigger circle. Again, forgive my circle. We would draw a circle that represents all cold-blooded things, not just snakes, but all cold-blooded things. And then in that, in that circle of cold-blooded things, I would draw a circle that represents snakes. Okay, let's say, let's do a squiggly, represents snakes. Okay, so that's all snakes are cold-blooded. Okay, so there's not, if you're in that snake circle, you're also in the cold-blooded circle. Okay, now, that second premise, or that second um, statement, all snails are cold-blooded. What does that tell me? All that tells me is I need to make a snail circle that is completely encompassed within the cold-blooded circle, not have it be halfway like that. That would be some snails are cold-blooded, right? Um, so all snails are cold-blooded, so I, all I have to do is draw snails somewhere in this circle. There is nothing that says these two circles have to overlap at all. All it says is they both need to be in this cold-blooded circle, okay? So that conclusion, all snails are snakes, well, we kind of recognize it's ridiculous on the face of it, but it we know it doesn't follow because these two circles do not overlap. They're not organized in a valid way where one nests inside the other, okay? But so, so if we look at, if we look at this argument, if we look at this argument um, and we ask ourselves, are the statements in it true? Are the premises true? The answer is actually yes. 
All snakes are cold-blooded. All snails are cold-blooded. Okay, but they're not. The statements are not organized in such a way where they are valid. Okay, they're not valid. So they're not organized where they where they nest inside each other. So they're not valid. And so if I've got true statements, which I have here, true statements, but not arranged in a valid way, therefore I don't have a sound argument. Not a sound argument. Okay, so not valid, not sound, but true statements. Okay, okay. Let's look at let's look at one more, um, and then you could try the other one on your uh, on your own, and then we could discuss it. Okay. So let's end with so the one I want you to try on your own, um, out outside this video. Try on your own, and then. Um, and see what you can see what you can come up with is this last one. So last one's a little is challenging. It's a little difficult. Um, but but this first one here about the about philosophers. Try that one. I'll pause again for a second. Try that one. Okay. Were you able to get it? All right. So let's look at it. So now we've so unlike the other two arguments where we had all. Um, all of something, none. Now we've got all, but also none. We've got so we're adding we're adding some um, some complexity to these deductive arguments here. So you'll see that you'll see that um, we're still starting with we know it's deductive. We're starting with general statements and trying to arrive at something specific about Greeks. And how are we going to do that? Well, let's let's draw it out. Okay. So we, how do we draw out the statement "no philosophers are evil"? Because we haven't done we haven't done one like that before. So okay, let's draw a circle that represents all evil beings, just like we drew a circle earlier that said all selfish beings. Um, now we're drawing one that represents all evil beings. And how would I draw the statement "no philosophers are evil"? Well, I want to have I want to have a circle that does not connect at all with evil. Because if I had a circle that connected at all with evil, that would be some. Okay? So I want to have a circle completely detached from and disconnected from the evil circle. So that's it. Let's draw the circle like that. And that's a circle that represents philosophers. So if you are in that philosopher circle, okay, then you cannot be in the evil circle. They do not overlap. Okay, you know, like they're not a Venn diagram that overlaps. They're completely separate. Okay, so that's the first statement. Okay, how would I draw the second statement? This one we should be able to do because we've seen examples of this one previously. All Greeks are philosophers. How do I draw that? Okay, well, if I'm a Greek, then I've got to be completely encompassed in that philosopher circle. Again, can't be Partially in, that would be some Greeks. So if I'm a Greek, I'm in that philosopher's circle. Okay, so all Greeks are philosophers. Okay, there see that there are other philosophers that are not Greek, but if you are Greek, you are a philosopher, according to this, according to this argument, at least. Okay. So that conclusion, no Greeks are evil, does that conclusion follow? Are these are these statements, are these statements or premises organized in a valid way? Yes, they are. Because I can't be in this philosopher circle and also be in the evil circle at the same time because they don't overlap at all. Okay? So that state, that conclusion, no Greeks are evil, follows, follows um, in, in, in a valid way. Is my deductive argument though sound? And this that means I'm checking for that second point. Are my statements true? Whoops. Are my statements true? Well, I mean, I think you probably realize no, they're not. I mean, no philosophers are evil. I could I could definitely argue with that. And then all Greeks are philosophers. This one's clearly not true. Um, anybody who's who thinks about that for half a second realizes that's not true. Um, so it's this is 
again, an example of not a, an, an argument that's not sound. Okay, I've got statements that are organized properly and validly, but they're not true statements. Okay, so to recap, I want to show you that you can have false statements, which we have here, organized in the right way. Okay, still a bad argument, but we can have false statements organized properly, and then we could also have, as we saw earlier with the sn snakes and snails, we can also have true statements that are not organized validly, okay? It still leads to the same conclusion, which is it's not, it's not a sound argument, it's not a good one, okay? Um, so try, the, uh, try this last example on your own, and see how you do. It's it's tricky. It's got some all, it's got some some. I want you to try that one and see how you see how you do. Okay. So there we just looked at de we just looked at deductive arguments. Now with inductive arguments to go back to where we were at the beginning, we had we'd said that inductive arguments are sort of the reverse of deductive. So we're not starting with general ideas, we're starting with specific observations um, and then hoping to arrive at a general conclusion, obviously keeping in mind that there are no guarantees. Now, with because inductive arguments were starting with something specific, we need we we need um, we need to look at specific examples. Um, and so Doc, you know, doctors use inductive arguments. We talked about that, um, and so it's with inductive arguments. It's going to it's going to vary case by case. Um, but what what I want you to be aware of when we're looking at inductive arguments is places where because we, we don't we don't have to worry about with inductive arguments we don't have to worry about statements being organized in the right way um, or um, we don't have to worry about that. We have to worry about statements being true or not. That we don't we still have to worry about. Um, but we need to worry about other things when it comes to inductive arguments. Um, and this is where we're going to talk about fallacies. Okay. So fallacies are there are two two kinds. Uh, there's a everything happens in twos today. Um, there are fallacies that can come with with deductive arguments. We already saw some problems, but we didn't, we didn't, see, we didn't see fallacies um, in the technical sense with, with the deductive arguments. But there are, I would say there are a lot more fallacies and traps you can run into when you're dealing with inductive arguments, especially because we're not, we're not dealing with conclusions that we can guarantee. So we, we need to be on the lookout when we're making deductive arguments for specific fallacies. And I've written, I've written down a couple of these fallacies for you. Um, so fallacies here. So fallacy is not a good thing. Fallacy, when you think fallacy, think false. Think problem, think not, not so good. So each one of these is a problem. And each one of these, I would say, applies to inductive arguments. Okay, so the ad, the ad hominem fallacy. Some of these, and you'll, we'll see as we go through these, they all have fancy fancy Latin names, um, uh, I think I cut out all the, with the exception, excuse me, with the exception of ad hominem, I, uh, I cut out all the other uh, um, fancy Latin names. So ad hominem just means that instead of looking at somebody's inductive argument that they're making, I'm attacking, I'm attacking their person. I'm attacking them as a person. Um, so you know, not looking at the inductive, you know, um, so I have, let's say I go to the doctor and the doctor has those, has those 10 patients and he, from that, the, the doctor induces that, um, the smoking is going to cause lung cancer. So, but rather, rather than looking at how many people did he gather? How, um, did he really study these people and see that they, that it was the smoking and not something else? Um, rather than doing that, I would attack him as a person personally. Like I would say something like, um, we can't really trust Dr. So-and-so's conclusion because he was in the bottom third of his medical school class. Well, that's not, that's not attacking or that's not, that's not addressing the actual inductive argument. That's attacking him as a person. Okay. Um, 
and that's and that's a fallacy. That's not that's that's not how we how we would want to be how we want to critique um, an inductive argument. Okay, um, related to related to that related to ad hominem, we're going to jump around a little bit. Related to the ad hominem is the straw man. Straw man is where, and they're related. They're different, but they're but they're related. Um, with the ad hominem, I'm attacking the person. I'm not even looking at the inductive argument they made. I'm just attacking them personally. With the straw man, I am looking at their argument. Okay, I'm looking at the things they've they've said, um, published, whatever it is. But I'm oversimplifying. Their argument. I'm not. I'm not looking at it in all of its complexity. Okay. So that same doctor, you know, I, I'll, look, I'll look at his his um, his study of his patients, and I might just say, well, he's he's um, you know, he lost <clears throat> he lost his um, he lost his mother because of lung cancer. So you know, ad hominem there. Um, so his argument is just um, he's just trying to attack. The cigarette companies. Okay, I'm not really looking in depth at. I'm, part of that was in, was an attack against him as a person. Okay, but then also part of it was oversimplifying that. Oh, he just he's got he has it in for the for the cigarette companies. He just doesn't like them. Uh, that's probably oversimplifying. He's probably making a, he's probably making a stronger case than that. Okay. Um, another thing we can look at with in. So problems with inductive reasoning is hasty generalizations. Hasty generalizations, because we can't guarantee a conclusion with our inductive arguments, um, we are relying on specific cases, right? To arrive at, remember back to this, back to this slide. Oh, where is it? Here, we're re we're relying on specific instances to conclude something general and so when we make the when we make the um whoops when we make the hasty generalization fallacy what we are doing is we're taking our specific cases but we are arriving at a general conclusion too quickly that's what the hasty part means okay so in that example i gave you of the doctor with the smoking cases he's taking he's taken 10 cases and from those 10 cases, he's arrived at the general conclusion that smoking causes lung cancer. I think he's probably right about at this time point we've studied smoking long enough, but just from those 10 cases, he can't generalize that smoking causes lung cancer. Just from those 10 cases. I would say that's hasty. Okay, too quick. Okay. Too quick. Um, hasty generalizations. I mean, if you think about <clears throat> if you think about racism, if you think about sexism, if you think about prejudice, um, these are all hasty generalization fallacies, right? I have one bad experience with somebody of a certain background, race, gender, etc., and then from that I make a general conclusion about that. Okay, that's a hasty generalization. So it's so. In a high level way, when someone is being racist, prejudiced, or stereotyping, they're 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 um, committing the inductive fallacy that is a hasty generalization. Right? Okay. Let's go through some of these other ones a little um, a little quickly. A bandwagon appeal is when I um, I so when you you jump on the bandwagon, you you agree that something is true just because other people believe it's true. Um, you're jumping on the bandwagon, right? Everybody else seems to think this is a good idea, so you think it's a good idea too. Or everybody's saying that this is a brilliant book, so I'm saying it's a brilliant book too. Or everybody's saying smoking causes lung cancer, so I'm going to say it too. Okay? That's the that's, uh, ap appealing to the uh, appealing to the crowd. You could also say um, either or. This is a this is also sometimes called the um, the false dichotomy. False dichotomy fallacy. This is when somebody somebody is arguing uh, something inductively, and they say that um, it's well. I know I know my I know in my conclusion it's gonna it could either be this 
or this. There's no, there's no other possibilities. So if it's not A, then it's B, because the only choices I have are A or B. Um, so what, what we can do if we're, we're, critique, we're critiquing that inductive argument, we can ask ourselves, well, is it really only the case that there's two options, A or B? Maybe there is, maybe there is option C. Okay. You'll, you'll often hear um, politicians like to use the either or or the false dichotomy fallacy. Um, politicians are, are, are fond of saying, well, we either have to do this or it's going to be this. This is going to happen. Well, I mean, is there not a third alternative or fourth alternative? It's either this or this. I mean, this is, you're usually trying to, when you're making or when you're committing this fallacy, you're, you're, you're trying to get somebody to act or to decide. And so you say, either you're either with us or you're against us. It's either this or this. Um, and very often when we're looking at inductive arguments, there's always a, there's usually a third possibility or, or, or more possibilities um, than just the two. Um, I want to do begging the question last because that, that one requires a little bit of um, explaining. But um, faulty causality. That one also has a fancy Latin name, but we're, I'll spare you that fancy Latin name. Um, what, what faulty causality means is when you think of causality, just think of cause and effect. Um, faulty means it's a problem because all, all of these fallacies are problems. Um, and so... When we, when we make the faulty causality fallacy, what we are, what we are doing, or the, the, the fallacy we are committing, and I'll, make, I'll give us another slide to work with here, is what we're doing when we have the faulty causality fallacy is that we assume because A happened and then B happened right after it, we assume that A caused B. Okay? We have A happening in time, and then shortly thereafter, B happens. So we assume A caused B. Sometimes, sometimes we are correct in thinking that, um, but other times we might be mistaken. And so ju just like we said with inductive arguments, we need other support to back us up. We can't just say, well, A happened and B happened, therefore A caused B. Right? If we could do that, then I could say, well, I had, you know, I had oatmeal this morning for breakfast, and then I got 100 on my exam, therefore the oatmeal caused me to get 100 on my exam. Well, there were probably other things going on in between uh, the oatmeal and the 100 that caused you to get a, to get a good grade on the exam, right? Um, so just because two things happen close in time doesn't mean the first thing caused the second thing. Um, we would say that A and B are correlated, meaning they are related in time, um, but we would... But in order to say definitively, not definitively, but in order to say with some certainty that A caused B, we would have to do what? We'd have to like eliminate other possibilities, right? Um, with me and my oatmeal, well, did I study for my exam? Maybe the studying is what caused me to get 100 on it. Um, did I work with a tutor? Well, maybe that's what caused me to get 100 on the exam. Um, it's probably not the oatmeal, right? Because, I, I mean, I, I need to see some really convincing evidence about oatmeal and brain activity and I need to see I need to see some of that before I I jump to that conclusion about it causing the the uh, the good grade on the exam okay so when we when we jump to the conclusion and say that a caused b just because the two happened side by side we're making the the uh the faulty causality fallacy where is it we're making this fallacy. You'll oftentimes see you'll I, I, and with all these fallacies, I, I want to um, stress with you that they are they're problems with de with uh, inductive thinking. But even really really smart people make these logical fallacies. Okay, um, you might see a study that comes out that says, okay, well we we passed this law in 2011. Um, and you'll see politicians make faulty causality as well. They'll say something like, we, we passed this law in um, 2011, and then in 2012, the, the crime rate dropped. So what do we assume from that? Well, maybe the law caused the crime rate to go down. Yeah, maybe. But maybe it was also something else. Maybe there was another possibility there. Okay? So we can't... In order to figure out if it was really the law or if it was really the first thing that caused the second thing, 
we need to eliminate other possibilities. We need to see why that law might lead to that conclusion, but we can't just automatically assume because they're close in time that one caused the other. Okay, last one. Begging the question, because I want to make sure we, uh, I don't go, go over time with the air. Um, so begging the question is a little tricky sometimes to, to see. And I'll, uh, I'll, do, I'll erase these so that you can use it here. So begging the question is oftentimes um, referred to as circular reasoning. Um, don't be confused with begging the question because people will often use that phrase. Well, this begs the question. Um, they'll often use that phrase just in conversation. And they often, when they say that, they often mean this um, this statement requires us to ask this, or this statement leads us to ask this. That's not what begging the question means. It's, it's begging the question is a very specific kind of, um, inductive logical fallacy. Okay. And when, when you make the begging the question fallacy, what you are doing is you are the, the point you are trying to prove, the thing you're trying to prove, you are stating as one of your reasons for why you believe what you're trying to prove. And you might be saying, well, how could I, how could the thing I'm trying to prove be one of my reasons for thinking what I think? Well, you're right. It can't be. I mean, that's why it's, you're kind of going in a circle. The thing you're trying to prove is the reason, um, for what you, um, for what you believe. Um, so imagine a, imagine a conversation between two people. Um, and one of the people asks the other person, um, Let's say person one asks person two, you believe in God? Another person says, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the other person's going to, person two is going to give the reason. Well, God speaks in the Bible. Okay. God speaks in the Bible. Um, when I was person one going to say to that, well, do you believe in God? Well, yeah, God is talking in the Bible all the time. Well, the person one is going to ask, well, why believe the Bible? That's right? the next logical and then the person person's answer is, well, God's word. Good argument. Is this gonna is this gonna convince somebody who's not a who's not already a believer? Well, no, because look at what look at what this person is doing. They're when they say the Bible is the word of God, what are they doing? They're assuming God exists in the first place to speak and to have words, right? The very thing the person is trying the very thing that person one is asking is, is God even there in the first place? Um, or, you know, not, not so much, do you believe in God, but, um, maybe, maybe the question would be better, it, you know, is there a God? Is, does God exist? Yeah. God speaks in the Bible. Why do you believe the Bible? Well, it's God's word. Okay. Well, the thing you're trying to prove is God there in the first place. You're saying you're using that as a reason to back up what you think. So you could see how this kind of goes in a circle and that you could imagine if this conversation between one and two, um, carried on, it would just kind of keep going in a circle and would go, and would go nowhere, right? It would go nowhere. Person two would not convince person one, nor vice, nor vice versa. Um, by the way, this is not to sort of, um, this is not a criticism of, of theology in any way. This is just that this would not, this would not be a persuasive argument to somebody who didn't already believe in God in the first place. Okay. So what you're seeing here, what you've, what we've just seen here are, a bunch of examples of how not to argue deductively, uh, inductively, sorry, how not to argue inductively. Okay, these are all problems with inductive arguing uh, inductively like this. Okay, let's talk about one because we're running, uh, I don't, I don't want to go much longer than, than an hour here. Um, let's do, I want to just talk to you about two, um, two problems with or two fallacies when it comes to 
deductive reasoning. So we talked about all those inductive fallacies. Um, we've got two deductive fallacies. And if you're looking at um, if you're looking at the homework for uh, for Monday, yeah, for Monday, um, you're going you might run into some of these deductive um, fallacies or one or one of these deductive fallacies. So pay pay close attention when you're reading that stuff. Um, so one of one of these deductive fallacies is called affirming. the consequent fancy name, don't worry about remembering that. Um, but what is this, how does this fallacy look? Well, remember, deductive arguments are set up in that form where we are starting with general statement and then hoping to arrive at something specific. So generally we looked at two statements and then a conclusion. So when we affirm the consequent, Again, this is an error. This is a mistake. I should clarify. Problems. No good. We don't want to do this. We want to avoid this. Um, so when we affirm the consequent, watch what we're doing. So imagine an argument that takes the following form. Whoops. If x, then y. Could fill in anything in there. If it if it snows, then it's cold. If I exercise, I'll build muscle. Fill in anything in there. Okay? Um, I'm just leaving them as, as X and Y for now. If X, then Y. Y, so let's assume, okay? Now we're saying Y is, y is the case. Whatever Y is. Therefore, X is the case too. Now you might look at this and go, but this seems this seems right. This seems like it this seems like it fits. Okay. Well, and when so when you're affirming the consequent, you are you're saying the consequent is the second second um, variable here, second letter here. Um, so you're affirming it, you're saying it's you're saying it is the case. So because we're saying it is the case, we're now assuming that X is also the case. It might seem okay to you when we're looking at it with just letters. However, look at what, what, what would happen if we plugged in actual um, situations in, 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 in for those variables. Let's, let's say we, we did, if it snows, it, let's make x snowing. If it snows, x, okay, then it is cold. Y. Y is the case. It is cold. Therefore, it is snowing. Mm, no good. Right? You could see why. Because it's possible, obviously it's possible for it to be cold without it snowing. Okay? So this would this would be a mistake. Okay? So I can't say if it's snowing, then it I, I can't say if it's snowing, then it's cold, and then it's cold, so it must be snowing. Nope. Wrong. Okay. Um, so that would be affirming the consequent, affirming the second letter here. How, what, what would be the right way to do this? Well, what would be the proper um, logical way to set this up? Well, you'd say, if x, then y, x is the case. Okay, therefore, I'll just do the, this is a symbol for therefore. Therefore, why is the case? This would be good. Okay, fill, it, fill in our, what we decided with the, with the snow, right? If it is snowing, then it is cold. It is snowing, therefore it's cold. Yeah, good, good argument, good deductive argument. Okay, um, this can't be true. This can't be true, this can't be true without that also following.
Okay, um, so this would be a, an example of a good deductive argument. Um, but this one, the fallacy, the one we just looked at, no good. Okay, this would be the opposite. So you're not you're here. You're saying you're not saying if x then y. X, you're saying if x then y, y is the case, therefore x must be the case. Nope, nope, no good. Okay, let's do one more. This one is called, and I think you're definitely going to see one of these on your uh, if you're do, if you're doing the homework, you'll definitely see this. Okay, but let's let's look at one more. This one is called denying. The antecedent. Fancy word, antecedent just means the first term. So we said the uh, the consequent was the was was um, y. Um, the antecedent would be x, it's the first one. Okay, so this fallacy takes the following form. If x, remember, fallacy, no good. Don't want to do this. If x, then y. Okay, we can again we can fill in whatever we want there not x, so we're denying the antecedent, the first one, not x, whoops, so x is not the case, therefore, not y. Okay, you might be looking at that and saying, but that also seems, that seems good, what? Um, they always seem right when you use, when you use the letters instead of actual situations. Um, but you could see how this would be, how this would not work. Okay, let's let's see why. Okay, if let's let's uh, let's not use let's not use weather. Um, let's use um, if um, if my dog if if a if you if it's a la if X is a Labrador, then X, then it's a dog. Okay, so if X is a Labrador, then it's a dog. Okay. Not X. It's not a Labrador. Okay, it's not a Labrador. Conclusion, it's not a dog. Hmm. You could see why this would be a problem, right? Because there are so many other kinds of dogs than the la than just a Labrador. Um, so, so you run into a fallacy here by by saying because it's not a Labrador, it must not be a dog either. Well, no, not not necessarily. Um, and the reason it's not the reason the reason it's it's a no. And if we if we drew this out, um, like we were doing before, I've got a circle that represents all dogs, and I've got X being a Labrador is here, and if I say, well, it's not, it's not a lab, therefore it must be something out here. Well, no, it could also be something in here too. It could also be another kind of dog too. So there's nothing that says if this is not a Labrador that it's not also a dog, because there are other categories of dog. Lab is a subset of the category dog, and if it's not the case, there might be other there might be other breeds, and there are other breeds, right? So this argument would be another example of a deductive fallacy or problem in, um, in deductive arguing. So to recap what we did today, we talked, we did a lot today, actually. We talked about um, two kinds of arguments, deductive and inductive. Okay? We said that deductive helps us arrive at a um, specific, starting with general and arriving at specific. We said inductive starts with specific instances and hopes to arrive at a general conclusion. We looked at some, whoops, we looked at some uh, inductive fallacies we could make, okay? And then we looked and, or, and then we looked at um, some, then we looked at some deductive fallacies, okay? And then we also, I forgot, we also looked at how to do how to do deductive arguments correctly. So how do we do them correctly? And then the fallacies afterward. Okay. So 
go back and review this and then also try the, as I said to you, try the, to challenge yourself, try this, try this, try looking at this argument and ask yourself, is this argument, um, is it sound, meaning is it valid, and is it all, are the statements also true? And then you'll arrive at and you'll figure out whether you whether it's a good deductive argument. Okay.